to the second edition of Summer of Ishq. We're back after last summer. Um, and we're back at a moment um, at which the world has seen all too little Ishq, especially in recent weeks, India, which has gone through an extremely traumatic uh, political and medical phase, uh, where, as I said, Ishq has been all too little in evidence. And related to that um, short supply of Ishq, We've also seen a degradation and a devaluation of debate and dialogue and dissent. And the second edition of Summer of Ish is hoping to restore some of those institutions and organizations and emotions to the public sphere because we have been sorely missing it. My name is Madhavi Menon and I am Director for the Center of Studies in Gender and Sexuality at Ashoka University. And we're joined today for our first session of the Summer of Ish 2021 which is a session on history by two professors um, who are, whose work is just brilliant, provocative, brave, courageous, interesting, um, and never, ever, ever dull or boring, um, and which is why they are both our opening showstoppers of the summer. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Charu Gupta from the University of Delhi, uh, who is a professor of history. And our second speaker will be Professor Joseph Massad, who is Professor of Modern Arab Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia University. Um, I would just like to sort of go over the format. Many of you might already be familiar with it, but let me just rehearse the format for us and then we can uh, dive straight into today's session. Each of the speakers will speak for 10 minutes at the beginning around the broad and general question that has been posed to them, which is, can we rethink histories of sexuality? And they have been invited uh, to freely interpret this question as they will and talk about it in context that they would like to impart to us. So Professor Gupta will go first and then Professor Massad, 10 minutes each on, can we rethink histories of sexuality? After that, we will follow it with about 10 minutes of cross-pollinated conversation between the two of them based on their opening remarks. And after that, we will open up for 25 to 30 minutes of Q&A with the audience which reminds me, all of you listening, watching, um, sort of eavesdropping out there, please post your questions at any point during the first half an hour, 40 minutes on the Q&A section on the little button in front of you. So you can't uh, post on the chat session because that's been disabled, but on Q&A, please, please, please post your questions as many as you'd like throughout uh, the session and Shreyashi from CSGS will uh, curate them and pose them to the speakers uh, at the end. So uh, without any further waste of time, uh, because it's already been a year since we were last here with Summer of Ish, uh, I'd like to invite Charu first to address the question, please, of can we rethink histories of sexuality? Charu, all yours. Thanks a lot, Madhvi. So um, a very warm thanks to the Center of Studies in Gender and Sexuality and to Professor Madhvi Menon uh, for inviting me to be a part of this exciting discussion. And the Center under Madhvi's guidance has been doing just phenomenal work. And I congratulate her and the whole team for that uh, work and for those exciting conversations you know, that uh, you, know, you have been having. So in my 10 minutes, basically I wish to reflect on my research of 30 years, uh, which attempts to reclaim fragmentary sexualities through disparate arenas in British India. So basically what I'll do is I'll posit here three snapshots, which invite us to rethink histories of sexuality in South Asian history. So first is my investment in the popular vernacular as a constitutive archive of sexuality. Second, I'll talk very briefly about religious conversions to Islam and Christianity by women on the margins as sites of desire. Mm -hmm. And finally, the enactment of sexology from the margins uh, by women and uh, shudras, uh, Dalits. Uh, so the practice and potential of employing a fem feminist vernacular, not just as an object of analysis, but as a critical methodology for theorizing sexuality is, you know, I explore that through records of uh, incrimination, you know, which is reflected in the writings of upper caste Hindus and British officials. So I'm going to uh, share uh, 
uh, PowerPoint with you uh, at this point, uh, and I hope uh, that is visible. So uh, my first snapshot, you know, when I basically began my, you know, doctoral research, I was, you know, uh, keen to explore this interface between Hindu nationalism and sexuality in early 20th century. And what soon bothered me was that a lot of, you know, while the emergence of communalism had been highlighted by scholars, there had been little work on its linkages to sexuality. And as I explored conventional archival sources, I almost drew a blank as, you know, most of the stuff on riots, music before mosques, car protection movements was blind to questions of sexuality. But I then stumbled on this very rich repertoire of vernacular sources in local libraries, in uncatalogued books of the British uh, Library, materials that are often elided in uh, archival research. And I think in terms of his historical and literary politics, uh, the meanings of the vernacular are contingent on its context. And, uh, and precisely it is because of this malleability uh, that the vernacular holds promise. And these landscapes actually became the troubled sites where divergent contestations around sexuality came to be staged. Uh, the vernacular has been central to my work also because the non-vernacular archive usually records the cataclysmic and the official. Uh, but the vernacular is a tactic of the everyday and the anecdotal, you know, where women are ubiquitous um, and where varied meanings are imparted to sexuality. Also, I think discussions on sexuality often need a corporeal presence and a nearness of lived experience that the vernacular can offer. Now, as I explored intersections between sex, sociality, and power, I increasingly felt that while control over sexuality was brought under greater uh, prominence along modernity and colonialism, there were a rich variety of practices and complexities of cultural imagination that were also placing limits upon projections of respectability and homogeneity. So in some ways, there was no single code of a middle class morality and no final triumph of sexual conservatism. Because after all, you know, I'm talking particularly in the context of colonial India, this was a period when caste hierarchies and Hindu uh, patriarchies were qualified to some extent. Uh, this was a period of reforms, national movement, education, women's presence in the public arena, which did signal new opportunities, however limited they proved to be. So the vernacular became central to texts of pleasure, uh, love, uh, and sex and erotic consumerism actually became a part of the publishing a boom, creating a robust archive of sexuality. And while a substantial part of it was again, say masturbation, uh, multiple sex partners or homosexuality, it also embraced a range of standpoints which reified and constructed sexual norms on the one hand, but they also, you know, destabilized and questioned them on the other. So a central endeavor of my work is to explore voices and acts of transgressive sexualities, which precluded the crafting of a master narrative, and also how disorder creeps into this moral order. So in spite of increasing surveillance, uh, I think expressions of sexuality not only survived, but thrived, uh, you know, in this period. Uh, you know, attempts to control or censure sexualities, sexual identities, sex workers, certain languages, people, symbols, and culture were made. As this, uh, you know, images of controlling the relationship between uh, uh, the sister-in-law and the younger brother-in-law shows. Uh, but, you know, in some ways, these attempts by the dominant castes, majority communities, and patriarchies, you know, in many ways failed. So censorship, according to me, was, in many ways was a failed enterprise. Now, let me move very quickly to my second uh, snapshot. As I read the history of religious conversions, 
uh, especially by women on the margins, widows, Dalit women, prostitutes, as an archive of desire. So I think conversions point to women's ambiguous relationships to caste and religious identities, but they also show how conversions could be a mode of you know, coping with and transgressing an oppressive order. And uh, you know, in some ways, aiding a transformative politics of rights. So for example, conversions to Christianity, uh, while it uh, signaled discourses of respectability and missions of domesticity, would also become a way for women to negotiate codified relations. So, for example, clothing particularly became an indicator to distinguish Dalit Christian women from their unconverted counterparts, which even came to be recognized in reformist literature, as this cartoon shows. And the thing is that in early 20th century, there were these series of cartoons depicting the crisis of conversions, which entered the private, uh, which entered the print public sphere, and they put on display the perceived insecurities and sexual unease of reformist Hindus. And uh, while they were cataloging these kind of you know, alarmist uh, results, uh, supposedly of Dalit women's conversions, they could not help but acknowledge the change of demeanor and stature, you know, in Dalit women's modes of dressing, walking style, a gait and prestige. So I think these banal communications are pivotal documents in conceiving the anxieties of Hindus, while also inadvertently offering a counter politics of sartorial desire. Uh, there were also kind of jitters about individual conversions uh, to Islam, you know, particularly by uh, Hindu widows uh, due to romance, uh, which came to be rewritten as a language of abductions. So, uh, you know, and it was very much tied to negative portrayals, sexual portrayals of Muslims, uh, stereotypes about uh, widows' uh, sexual agencies, and, you know, fears of loss of uh, potential uh, childbearing uh, wounds. My final snapshot uh, very quickly, it, you know, how there was amidst an efflorescence of vernacular sexology literature, you know, I focus on the writings of a woman, uh, Yashoda Devi, who was a woman Ayurvedic specialist and Santramdi, a Shudra anti-caste reformer. They both in different ways by functioning very much within heterosexual paradigms they evolved a heterosexual ethics, which gave women a greater prominence in governing sexual life. Um, I don't know how many minutes I have, I think about two or three minutes. Uh, but what I want to say is that in line with social purity feminists, Devi urged her clients to have less sex while she questioned masculine sexual privileges and functioned very much within a monogamous mold, which reflected limits of Brahmanical uh, discourses as well. But Santram Bia, you know, who translated Mary Stokes' writings into Hindi for the first time, made a serious bid to translate sex without becoming complicit uh, with its analytical uh, regimes. And, uh, you know, he displays the possibilities of anti-caste perspective as he celebrated a utopian sexual future of man-woman relationships uh, a better familial order, which supported free choice of multiple partners and sex before marriage. So I think such figures complicate histories of sexualities and open a world of uh, epistemic poss possibilities. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, conclude, you know, by in, in one minute by saying that, you know, when you question the authority and authenticity of the official archive, uh, you know, and I have been inspired in part by the intellectual provocations of Dalit and feminist studies. I, you know, what concerns me is not just erasures and silences in the archives. Uh, I just don't want to, you know, read between the lines. But I think we can reframe histories of sexualities through vernacular imaginative texts, which at times can alter our uh, dominant historiographical conceits. So I think the widely differentiated print sphere uh, reveals how dominant trends towards uh, sexuality, uh, you know, 
collided with other kinds of vernacular imaginative uh, texts and altered dominant historiographical uh, conceits. I'm going to end here and uh, you know I'll take some of the things in question now until later on. Thank you very much, Charu, for that wonderful and, and, and fascinating opening. Um, uh, Joseph Massad, let me invite you now to give us your 10 minutes. And you need to unmute yourself, Joseph. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, event. I'm very excited and, and, and honored to be here and in this a great company. Um, I um, will speak in more general methodological uh, terms in response to the question you posed, although I'm very happy when doing the Q&A to answer questions specific to my area uh, of historical expertise and geographic expertise, namely uh, the Arab world uh, more generally. Um, I want to make two points, perhaps, in uh, response to the question of thinking the history of sexuality. Uh, they're kind of cautionary uh, uh, notes, if you will. The first one is to make sure we link uh, what we call the history of sexuality to a specific geography and how the very category sexuality is not as often is claimed by Europeans and Euro-Americans a universal category, but rather, and I argue, it is always a specific cultural product of European and Euro-American societies and economies. It is true that it would subsequently through colonialism um, uh, spread as a notion and even as an institution geographically around the world, but its spread would be limited by the different kinds of colonial institutions that were built since the 19th century. Another aspect of this geography of sexuality is the fact that non-European geography is always placed in a comparative grid with this Europe and its settler colonies, wherein European successes with regards to what now passes as sexual rights and sexual liberties um, is always compared to the failures of non-Europe. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, another aspect of the geographic uh, importance of the question um, of the history of sexuality is, for example, how often European and Euro-American historians begin in Greece, or in ancient Greece, if you will, which was, of course, of the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean, um, and how uh, basically it becomes uh, uh, after the Renaissance, an imagined place of origin. Yet, in a lot of in a lot of these histories, um, the European and Euro-American historians posit the history of European desires and passionate practices as having come from uh, this ancient Greece, um, which is treated not just as an imagined place of origin, but rather as having an actual material history that is adopted and espoused today as objective in terms of the linkage uh, from the ancient times to modern Europe. Another aspect, I think, of geography in relation to thinking through the history of sexuality is the 19th century anthropology of so-called sexual practices of the indigenous and the primitive outside of Europe compared to white civilized Victorian sexual norms. Um, this becomes, of course, uh, linked in a social Darwinist way of the, the non-white primitives somehow remind Europeans of their childhood, of the past of Europe in a kind of a, a, a staged history of social Darwinistic development. Uh, in a lot of these uh, anthropological descriptions, uh, much is discussed about the so-called debauchery of Native Americans uh, or Australians or Pacific Islanders or uh, Papuans, Africans, Indians, Arabs, uh, the Japanese, um, etc. So the history in, in that sense is a history of their geographic um, uh, entry into European thought of non-Europe. So white anthropologists and sexual libertarians uh, begin to deploy today the present of these non-European societies as somehow repressive compared with the post-sexual revolution Europe um, and the US specifically after the 1960s. Um, 
The final point I want to make about geography is that the very universality of the typologies of sexuality that are posited uh, in European thought and science and law since the late 19th century, but especially uh, in the post-World War II period, begin to, uh, uh, this universality is also based on the same colonial anthropology to advance Euro-American sexual liberation of the 60s and 70s um, as being of, of global uh, importance and impact. The second point that I want to raise aside from geography is the question of the political economy of sexuality, that there's a history of this political economy that produces a sexuality that is not always paid attention to. Capitalism, of course, and the rise of race and sexuality and the homo heterobinary in the late 19th century, especially in institutions like law and medicine, um, with the rise of the bourgeois nuclear family. But imperialism and colonialism uh, would be enablers of a kind of novel European sexual experience in non-Europe, uh, often defined as free of European inhibitions. Um, imperialism and capitalism as such also affect uh, or and, and enable labor migration uh, to the metropole from within and without Europe and its settler colonies, um, transforming kinship ties, residential patterns, and allowing new configurations of community, all of which would affect the rise of what now is called uh, sexual communities uh, uh, in the West or has been called as such. Post-World War I and post-World War II Europe uh, begin to see a rise of social movements. Uh, Post-World War I would be demanding liberties and some decriminalization, especially in places like Germany, but also uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, Post-World War II, we begin to see the rise of sexual identity and rights talk in uh, the US and subsequently in Western Europe. Um, the latest stage of imperialist capitalism or neoliberalism um, uh, is the era of the universalization of both the white gay movement and the white human rights industry. It is not coincidental that this happens, but I think there's a structural relationship. Uh, it begins to expand geographically again, uh, wanting to include those who willingly or are forcibly identified as uh, belonging to these new sexual identities in non-Europe, but also excluding them from the power to represent themselves. Uh, meanwhile, of course, there's an internationalization of uh, homophobia, not only of sexual rights by conservative US elites, especially missionary white European and Euro-American Christians um, that continues to be uh, 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 operative today. Um, perhaps uh, also the point about uh, uh, political economy uh, relates to the issue of class, local elites and the upper middle classes who seem to have struck an alliance with diaspora communities of uh, people from uh, uh, the third world in Europe and its settler colonies, as well as an alliance with imperial institutions, especially NGOs of the human rights variety, usually funded by Western European or uh, countries or the US. All seem to be unified in one way or another by the quest for a kind of white normativity as a liberating liberalism. Um, allied and you know and, and, and they staff imperial NGOs but uh, uh, in an alliance I would say that uh, seeks to bring about this liberation of humanity through a repudiation uh, or rather a replication I would say of white metropolitan elite norms parading as universal. Um, I think uh, Guy Tri Spivak uh, uh, identified uh, the culture line at home as very important being a class line, meaning uh, both the elite at home and the upper middle classes who speak the language of the NGOs, as well as diaspora members, uh, uh, community members uh, of particular countries in Asia or Africa, adopting a white middle class normativity in, the, in, in Europe or its uh, white settler colonies, and the NGOs deploying these norms as a kind of an imperial policy. Here, I think uh, uh, internet, satellite TV, social media, all became major vehicles for the sexual culture industry, uh, controlled and owned, of course, by white Europeans and US corporations and owners, even if on, oca on occasion subverted by those who resist the imposition of uh, uh, these categories. Um, 
I would say uh, the deployment today of the history of the institutional and social oppression of what was considered deviant desires and sexualities in Europe and its settler colonies, um, uh, this deployment by those mostly European but also non-white diasporas and local elites whose identities today, uh, in contrast with previously, are sponsored by US and European imperialism and racism to blackmail and threaten those who refuse to submit to this white sexual normativity. Um, the intimidation, of course, is carried out in the name of liberating the oppressed. Thus, uh, the Western experience continues to be presented to us, not as a cultural and a specific experience, but as a universal experience, whereas any opposition or resistance to its categories or epistemology is always identified as local and cultural. Um, I am not sure if I'm out of time. Almost. A few okay. seconds, you can just wrap up. So that the last uh, perhaps point to make is that the politics of imperial intimidation today is that uh, tells us that opposition to this universalizing and imperial imposition of sexual identities on the non-white world, on its peasants and working classes and its poor underclass, all of this is depicted as homophobia. Essentially, the claim is that same sex and even different sex pleasurable physical practices cannot exist or be allowed to exist outside the hetero-homo binary, and that the refusal and the resistance to collapse them in the way that the sexual internationalists do indicates homophobia and a stance against sexual liberation. I contest that reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Joseph. Um, if I might just sort of set the ball rolling, Charu and Joseph, just by asking you, uh, a particularly a question that might be particularly urgent at this moment, socially, uh, politically, um, you know, around the world, uh, which is this idea of what our history is and our can be any group or any denomination or any demographic or any country or any culture. And there's always a, um, a sort of plea for recognizing our history uh, and it inevitably, you know, just speaking in the Indian context, it tends to go hand in hand with a certain kind of conservative political uh, agenda. And so my question to both of you is really based on what both of you have said, is there any way we can own or we can refer to a notion of our history without actually sounding or being conservative? Is there any notion of our history that can actually be radical, liberatory, rather than being parochial and narrow-minded uh, in some way, shape, or form, which is to say, if there is a universalizing impulse of a historical sexuality on the one hand, and there is the localizing impulse of parochial, our historical specificity on the other hand, how do we speak, keeping both these conversations in mind, how do we prevent ourselves from slipping into the mire of political conservatism? Your thoughts. Okay, uh, can I go first? Please, Charu, yeah. So uh, thanks for that uh, question, Madhvi. And I think we all grapple uh, with this in a very central way that what is our history? You know, like, I don't think so um, that uh, dominant upper caste or white normativity, as Joseph Massad said, or uh, history of the middle class or, you know, the bourgeois kind of rise or the rise of, you know, capitalism and colonialism can be labeled as our history. And I think various attempts in history, whether it is the subalterns histories or feminist histories or Dalit voices, have very much attempted to reclaim this uh, space and you know I, I think that uh, it is precisely by saying that there is no particular notion that history uh, can claim authority over or appropriate because there are multiplicities residing in the seemingly unitary our history you know so uh, I think it is an expansive form that can encompass you know uh, lots of other voices uh, deviant voices and, and while we question, that is why I think uh, many of feminist historians, you know, historians, um, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, black scholars, Dalit historians have been trying to do precisely that, you know, to in some ways, why highlight 
the politics of negation, you know, in many ways, you know, the kind of uh, the way in which uh, normativity has been constructed, but not to end uh, there, but also show that how there are possibilities, you know, residing uh, within this kind of expansive, what the fissures, the cracks, the subversions, the deviances against the disciplinary dominant power regimes uh, of history should not remain just faint threads. Uh, they should not constrain uh, our analytic horizons of sexuality. Uh, and I think that is why we need to go beyond just the politics of negation, uh, you know, uh, and uh, expand our arenas. Mm, okay, Joseph? Um, I think perhaps we should begin with a, a, a possessive pronoun, uh, our, mm. our history. Um, I think this is uh, uh, where perhaps uh, nationalism and new identity politics uh, can produce these kinds of pronouns uh, where we can speak of our or their histories. Um, on the one hand, I think there was an important move uh, during uh, colonial uh, historiography and perhaps early in the independence movements of countering uh, European impositions of histories with a version of our history. I distinctly, of course, remember reading this in uh, Amilcar Cabral's work who questioned uh, Western notions that Africa does not have a history uh, because history begins with a class struggle, for example, and asserting that there is a history even before what is considered to be class struggle. I understand and support the move to counter these kinds of totalizing European colonial uh, depiction of the peoples without history uh, being uh, non-Europe. At the same time, I think the question of our is a, is, a, is, is a new kind of understanding of what history is. In my work, I've tried to show that um, much of what passes even as ancient medieval, so-called medieval Arab history uh, is introduced, of course, by European Orientalists. Um, uh, I know many similar processes by the Orientalists were also uh, 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 replicated in India and elsewhere in the East. Um, the idea, even the periodization of Arab and Muslim history comes from Orientalist historians. So um, when I begin to write, I, I, was, I was interested, in fact, in my project and how 19th century and early 20th century onwards, um, Arab uh, historians and intellectuals began to retrieve our ancient history before the colonial encounter. And it's very interesting that what I show is it's always a response to a colonial and orientalist narrative accepting uh, many of its uh, axioms, even though engaging with others that it found uh, degrading or uh, uh, making it less uh, civilized compared to Europeans. So the question of history then, uh, especially in, in the modern period in the Arab world, I would feel is highly influenced by a colonial version of what that history should be, even if it reaches back to a pre-colonial period. Right. I mean, what's, what's fascinating, and Shriyashi, we can, we can start with audience questions soon, but what's fascinating, Joseph and Charu, and what both of you said, and potentially most contentious, uh, is that sexuality with a capital S um, might actually have a history, and might actually be a historical phenomenon, uh, which, would, which would perhaps rub a lot of people the wrong way, um, because we are taught to, we have been taught to, we like to think of, our, there it is again, the possessive pronoun, our sexualities as being completely um, uh, owned by us, as being completely uh, personal, even though it should be legible across the world. And what both of you are saying is that A, history is not singular and sexuality is not singular and therefore there are sexualities always multiple. This is Charu's point. And Joseph's point is the very idea of sexuality as being singular is very much a colonial phenomenon. And so in, in many ways then, and here we are sitting towards the end of what is celebrated around the world as Pride Month, uh, which is itself very much a sort of corporate capitalistic um, Western notion of what it means to inhabit a particular sexuality. So I just find that fascinating. And I'm, and I'm sure our audience will have questions about that as well. So having said that, Shreyashi, uh, let me call on you to uh, feel some questions from the audience, and then I'd like to come back to this point a bit later on. Please go ahead. 
Thank you, Professor Charu and Professor Joseph for such an insightful talk. Um, our first question is, can the framework of history in its insistence of veracity, facticity and truth ever encode desire since desire can never be put into a fixed position? Hmm. And either of you can go first. All right, I'll, 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 I can uh, try to field this. Um, and I think this links uh, well with uh, uh, Professor Menon's uh, point about desire. I think one of the important things is the way sexuality seems to have now enveloped all questions of desire. It replaces the term desire, the, the desires that people uh, uh, had had a, a much uh, older uh, notion than sexuality, wherein desire today seems to could only be able to live and exist within this uh, 19th century notion of sexuality. So in this sense, I think, uh, uh, you know, the history uh, is unable to account for it, which is why anthropology came to the aid of history in the 19th and 20th century to pretend to tell us what lived desires and pleasures were like. So I think the attempt to huddle uh, physical pleasures and practices under the umbrella of something we call the sexual is what is recent and seems to elide, engage in an illusion of desire and seems to uh, make desire something innate as uh, Professor Menon was saying earlier, rather than uh, a social product as in desire is always um, uh, an outcome or uh, in many ways enabled by um, the, uh, the, the very environment within which desiring subjects live. It is not innate in that sense, right? I, I, I always give the example of um, if, if people lived in a society that did not have okra, they would have no relationship to okra. They would not like it. They would not hate it. They would not even be indifferent to it. Whereas if they live in a society where there is okra, and of course, as we know, appetite or hunger is a, is a desire, uh, then they would have a relationship to it. Either they would desire to eat it and not alone. It might be one of many things that they like to eat. They might utterly hate it. They might be uh, indifferent to it. In that sense, desire like appetite is always socially constructed, um, in my opinion, uh, but constructed differently depending on how one uh, experiences one's surroundings and within the political economy and society within which uh, one's desires get to be formed. I also want to quickly add to this and just say that, you know, uh, it is the whole attempt of uh, feminist scholarship precisely to question the idea of truth in history and uh, histories of sexuality, desire, love, homosexuality really lead you to explore other arenas, to expand your archival arenas. That is precisely why uh, you know, auto, uh, autobiography, letters, dreams, uh, you know, uh, and even your thought process mentalities, uh, you know, which which don't have the fixed meaning of truth in history, you know, have been used, uh, you know, by uh, various kinds of historians uh, to explore uh, or expand our definitions uh, of sexuality. And precisely that is why the idea of truth is very, very questionable in its truth. I mean, that, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, for instance, I have suggested that rather than Foucault's title of the history of sexuality with its sort of definite uh, article can be replaced with either a history of sexuality or histories of sexuality, uh, which would allow us to do precisely the kind of contestation that both of you are insistent that we need to perform in order to think about uh, desire, gender, sexuality. I would like to add a point to this in, in agreement, of course, with Professor Gupta's uh, point. In, in my own work, in my book, Desiring Arabs, I insisted on doing an intellectual history. Mm -hmm. And when it came to the present, I sought to understand how desires are represented in fiction, especially uh, in novels. Yet, of course, those who were looking for facticity and veracity insisted that the book does not tell them how Arabs desire today or how they enjoy sex. And I try to always explain that nothing can tell them that. Uh, and of course, as a psychoanalytic thinker, as an Arab, whatever that means, I'm unable to tell them why I desire the way I desire. Right. So that so it's always the, the issue of facticity and veracity, I think, is a, is a major problem in the quest for these kinds of histories. I mean, it's true when you were talking about anthropology, I was going to say in my biased role as professor of English, that really liter literature is the subject that gives you uh, this kind of access that both of you are talking about so brilliantly. Um, Shreyashi, please. 
as we talk about rethinking histories of sexuality, somebody has asked that what would it be like to uh, think about uh, politics uh, in terms of sexuality and how can you rethink sexuality in the pol in in the political sense? Hmm. Well, all sexualities are political. I don't think so. You can think of uh, you know uh, sexuality uh, minus politics. So in some ways. Uh, I don't think so. Sexuality is just neatly translatable, you know, either just as, uh, you know, influenced by Western sexology or, you know, or, or Western sex ideas of sexuality or, uh, you know, how indigenous notions uh, of sexuality were uh, much more ambiguous and broad. That is one sphere that, you know, how we need to constantly interrogate, you know, a singular notion uh, of sexuality. But on the other hand, the politics of sexuality is precisely this, how a singular notion is, you know, what Professor Madri Menon is saying, what Professor Massad is saying is precisely this. Our constant fight is how a, the, pol the political of sexuality constantly attempts to frame it in neat, linear homogeneous frames while the rea while what we see on the ground is much more messy much more inchoate much more polyvalent polyvalent so i think uh, for a fuller exploration of sexuality's polyvalent political potential it is precisely this that's why we need to question uh, the political stated defined definition of sexuality that is precisely uh, while we why we interrogate the politics of sexuality. Hmm. Hmm. I, I of course I agree, and I, I would add something about the question of um, uh, today in the modern world the existence of regimes of repression and production of uh, sexuality, right? The same regime is a regime that produces and represses uh, different kinds of configurations of desires and sexual identities. Um, and we see also a transformation. And, and I always try to point this out, how, for example, um, uh, in the 1950s through the 19. 80s, uh, the US empire and Europe were, uh, of course, themselves uh, interested in repressing different forms of sexual practices and identities. Suddenly, you begin to see in the early 1980s during Reagan, a very conservative uh, president, an attempt to use uh, the imperial espousal of gay rights as a weapon against communist Cuba, for example. Yeah. We begin to see major propaganda against Cuba uh, as a country that uh, represses a allegedly homosexuals or uh, what came to be termed now as gay, as, as, as the uh, bon mot of choice, uh, so to speak. And then we begin to see how empire begins to sponsor a specific form of sexual identity um, as a, a defender of and a liberator of those who are oppressed around the world. So while um, in the 50s and 60s, sexual liberation and the equality of the sexes was an anti-imperial leftist project, we see a kind of an abduction and a transformation of these struggles into uh, uh, imperial struggles. Yet many of those who staff the NGOs or uh, who are employees of the NGOs, often they depict themselves as activists rather than salaried employees, want to tell us that it's still, these issues continue to be framed in the more radical leftist uh, uh, struggle for justice um, uh, and a liberatory form of politics rather than as, a, as an imperial form of imposition on those who resist uh, a white imperial middle-class Protestant normativity. I mean, that is, that is precisely that fault line, right? That both of you are pointing to, which is this idea. And let's say, speaking in the Indian context, the official uh, state policy of saying, well, homosexuality is a foreign invention. It didn't exist in India, it wasn't here, which on the one hand sounds like an anti-imperial position, uh, on the other hand, it's just deeply homophobic and, and it sort of is homogenizing a certain us versus them history, which is what Charu was warning us against doing. And so that, that is that fault line that we're all standing on right now. That's the fault line that we're just sort of, you know, that's threatening to crack our movements, our politics, our ideas in so many interesting ways. Interesting is a kind word, I think, in so many scary ways, actually. Uh, but it's not only, I think, um, 
It, I think it is both anti-imperialist and homophobic, just yeah. as the sexual libertarians are also racist and imperialist. Right. In many, now, of course, this is, not, all is. sexual libertarians are so, but you know, yeah. but in this particular divide, this is the division. Please, yeah. uh, Professor Doctor. Charu, you were going to add something? No, I was supporting what uh, Professor Masad and you were saying, that it is precisely that we need to question the kind of Hindu uh, homophobia that is there in India, but we also need to question the way in which uh, the liberal position of the West is posited, you know, with civil sexuality. I think that also uh, needs to be interrogated, you know, and how that in some ways, the imposition of a singular term, you know, homosexuality yeah. takes away from the range of, you know, possibilities and, and the way in which sexualities are expressed, uh, you know, by various kinds of people, uh, you know, to take the example of India. Yeah, and, and the sort of question of, of gay marriage, which is now beginning to emerge in India, is one of those flashpoints, right? Because uh, officially the government has said, we cannot extend the institution of marriage to homosexual people because it affects the sanctity of our culture. You know, all those tired and tested phrases that we've heard on the one hand. On the other hand, I was recently at a session with a spokesperson of the ruling uh, party that said, no, no, we're not opposed to gay marriage. We're only opposed to it because we want to make the legislation so watertight that no one can oppose it later. So it's this sort of double speak, which is just so fascinating uh, to I see that. It's sort of, sorry, go on, Charu. No, I think the moment you try to define sexuality through fixity, give it a definite yeah. meaning, uh, you know, you just you know, you take away what, what we mean by sexuality. Yeah. You know, it can encompass a spectrum of rubrics, texts. It can include, in the colonial context, it could include eugenics, conjugality, marriage, home science, sexual health issues, birth control manuals, erotic and pornographic material, sex advisory literature, popular writings on sex. So I think the moment you try to give it fixed meanings, I think, uh, you know, you are entering into deeply problematic domain. Right. So that watertight legislation is, is actually a scary prospect. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shreyashi, please. Um, our next question is that in vernacular or contemporary popular cultures, what is often labeled as vulgar is dismissed as some sort of escapism. So what would you say such a context is escaping and where is it escaping to? <laughs> I, I think that the one, you know, there is there are two kinds of opinions you will get. The vernacular, the popular, the local is sometimes either seen as completely subversive as, you know, as being, uh, you know, upholding various kinds of sexual desires, sexualities, etc. Or it is seen as uh, completely, you know, uh, homophobic, it's completely seen as uh, strengthening dominant position. I think these kind of either or positions in terms of the vernacular are problematic. And I, and, and I, as I said, it's the malleability and precisely uh, it's different contexts that you know provide different meanings. So, for example, a word like Kama Shastra or Kok Shastra or Riti Shastra or Rati Kriya, you know, that can uh, replace uh, sexuality, you know, uh, in 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 the vernacular uh, domain. And again, it could mean sex, pleasure, desire, erotic love. So, uh, so I think that. Uh, yeah, the vernacular, it's not to say, it's not a position that you're taking the vernacular versus the official, you know, I think uh, for, for, you know, for his, for subversive histories of sexuality, uh, you, you read against the grain, you read with the grain, and you also uh, show the possibilities and problems in the vernacular as a source. Mm -hmm. Joseph? I, I don't have much to add, I think. I I mean, I, if I can add on your behalf, Joseph, because I was actually thinking back to something you said earlier when you said that your, your study on Arabs actually ended with the study of literature or fiction and, and novels, which, of course, is often the classic example of escapism, right? When you want to escape your reading a novel or your reading fiction. And if the question that Shreyashi is fielding is the question of, you know, where are you escaping to or what are you escaping from? I think your position is actually novels far from being an escape are giving you a real slice of reality and life uh, that we want to demonize as escapism. But, well, I mean, for, for me, it's a kind of the language of intelligibility. What, what is interesting for me about the novel 
is that uh, whatever is represented within it yes. of societal forces or sexual desires or practices um, is uh, communicated in this kind of language that is immediately intelligible. So therefore, it is not an ethnographic study that I do. It is not an interview form, but it is not, I'm, I'm not uh, a prompting an answer from someone I'm questioning in the classic anthropological method, but rather seeing, as, you, as you've said, a kind of a representation. It is still fictional. It is not reducible to reality, but it is a fiction, it is fiction that, is used, that uses a language that is intelligible, that relies on the fact that the reader understands uh, what these terms mean. And therefore, it gives me an inkling into the kinds of thinking and expressions of desire that the novelist would use. And in that sense, it is not uh, uh, produced as an answer, right? As in, do you yeah. support or not support this or that type of sexual practice? Yeah. Do you yeah. identify or not identify? So for me, indeed, that kind of, um, uh, and of course, there are, you know, the, the novels in Arabic do, uh, uh, there's a big range from those who use more of a classical language uh, with those who actually use a classical language, except in dialogue where the vernacular is used yeah. uh, between the different characters. So indeed, the vernacular, there's a two level uh, uh, sort of literary uh, uh, style within the same novel that does communicate, if you will, uh, 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 these types of, uh, in, or, or this type of intelligibility of notions, concepts, desires, and practices. Right, right. That's great. Thanks. Um, the next question is, how can we, why are we still struggling to escape the colonist narrative of sexuality when colonizers have moved forward with their seemingly progressive views on sexuality? They, they have not, if I may I say. Think so they have. <laughs> but Professor Massad can go. Yeah. Um, um, no, of course they, they have not. And, and remember, this is what I what I uh, uh, always try to contrast. For example, uh, in the. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, general anthropology and orientalist representations of Arab desires showed it as too debauched, too open and expressive and primitive compared to Victorian sexuality. However, the same type of the, the same types of acts and practices and histories would be deployed after the uh, so-called sexual revolution uh, in uh, the U.S. and Europe to, to, to show that Arabs are in fact repressed sexually and not open. So it's very very interesting compared to Victorian repression, Arabs would be debauched. I, uh, and, and of course, so would Indians, so would Africans. Compared to uh, post sexual revolution uh, Europe, uh, Arabs and other uh, non white peoples become repressed, uh, their women repressed sexually, etc. So the idea of progress is, is, is a problem. And the, the colonizing narrative continues. Those who control these narratives, the, again, the issue that was brought up earlier uh, on the question of gay marriage is a replication uh, of, uh, of uh, European norms. The very term gay, which is adopted across languages, including European languages, um, is interesting because it is deployed in the vernacular to mean a certain thing at the local level. But for example, the uh, uh, heterosexual internationalization does not function the same way. The term straight has not traveled around the world the way the term gay has mm -hmm. and is not adopted, even though in many middle-class communities today and upper-class communities in uh, around the world, in the Arab world that I, that I know very well, but elsewhere, uh, where the term gay may be used for, and it, it would mean different things than it does in the West, the term straight is never used, hardly ever used by women or men. Um, so it's very interesting to me what travels and what does not, even though the heterosexual bourgeois uh, sexual model is pushed more heavily uh, and internationalized so much more heavily since the rise of the romantic novel, since the rise of Hollywood, since the rise of the French kiss, etc. All of that, it seems to me, uh, uh, has had more of an internationalizing effort initially than uh, the later agenda of sexual rights and homosexuality and homophobia that have been internationalized. Yet there's a specific liberatory claim that is made by European purveyors of this international campaign, as well as their imperial sponsors, that somehow the adoption of these specific white middle-class urban European or American white terms like gay or queer is necessarily liberatory for the entire world to espouse because whatever they produce, of course, is universal and any negative response to it must be cultural and local, right? Mm 
way ahead. I just want to add, I, I think uh, Professor Nassad has put it uh, really well. Uh, I just want to add this, that even this uh, notion that there was single, you know, this shift from the repressed, uh, mm. from the debauched to the repressed is one story, but also this notion that the Victorian idea of sexuality was homogenous is, is deeply problematic. You know, the works of Linda Need and others have shown how, you know, even in Victorian England, there were all kinds of, uh, uh, sales of uh, semi-pornographic texts. There were all kind, even during French Revolution or what you would name it. So I think this this idea of Western homoge homogeneity, you know, of uh, kind of sexual representation is also a myth that needs to be busted because there are, you know, various layers and stories within this kind of supposedly homogenous Western narrative. And when we we interrogate dominant narratives, it's not that we are dom we are interrogating the whole of the Western paradigm. It is what has been dominant there, you know, which has also uh, repressed the other kinds of narratives that have existed in the West itself. You know. Yeah. So, so your point, Charu, is that there is actually no history that is homogenous, and mm -hmm. no history that is uniform, and that we really need to be attuned attuned to that. And and added to Joseph's point of you know the okra point, which I absolutely love the example of because I hate okra, can't stand <laughs> it, uh, too, too slimy for me. But you know, the okra example of uh, once you call something, give something a name, an object a name, then you're always relating to or against or in relation to it, uh, which I think is important for us to remember. Uh, Shreyashi, I think we have time maybe for one last question. Um, our next question is what would happen to the vernacular or any local text when it hits the archive and gets caught up in genres of representation? And can it even stay vernacular if it reaches power or will it be scaled up into new official normativities? Can the subaltern speak? Yeah, yeah, it's precisely that. And, and again, um, you know, I think I, I'll be uh, uh, repeating myself by saying that, you know, uh, uh, as I said, the vernacular itself does not hold any uh, liberatory uh, notions. And I think that, uh, you know, that, so for example, there has been uh, a, a massive resistance to, you know, official law making. So for example, the obscene representation, with obscene representations of women, when it became, you know, in, into the form of law, when it entered into the official portal, portals, it became deeply problematic. And that's why so many scholars and feminists have said that, you know, that what happens when uh, a language of rights is officially claimed and, you know, made into this official discourse in this watertight compartment, as uh, Madhi was saying, then you have, it's deeply problematic, even something like a law against sati, you know, which we would think is totally liberating, or, uh, you know, a, a law in favor of widow re, uh, remarriage, you know, a feminist scholars have shown how there itself, you know, a, a, a demand which arose, you know, uh, from, a, a, from a section of reformers, and that also once it was appropriate in the language of law, uh, became uh, uh, deeply problematic. So, of course, you know, the moment there is this kind of attempt to appropriate it, to define it to include it in the mainstream vocabulary uh, certain kinds of edges get lost but i don't want to end here i do i think um, that uh, you know you you can completely disparage and dismiss the official but i don't think so that that is the only uh, way to go forward i think uh, there are multiplicities of levels that we have to go while we have to uh, uphold uh, the voices of the subaltern, the local, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the suppress, the Dalits, etc. We also have to constantly, I think, engage with official arenas. Otherwise, we leave, leave that whole domain uh, you know, to the past that be, and we just don't engage with that. And I think it's very important that there are interventions uh, made there as well. Mm. Right. Joseph? I perhaps I perhaps would add that um, perhaps it's not only the archive. I um, I think I'm a bit Foucauldian here. I think it is about discourse. What I what Foucault called the incitement to discourse. That what happens to terms when they become when, when they begin to be or notions or concepts that begin to be given a certain kind of name in discourse. Can when they are captured by discourse, can they uh, resist or have they become uh, reified? Uh, this was something that I've always. Uh, uh, thought about ever since I was 18 and I went to the US, 
And there were two things I never understood when I arrived, and this is in you know, circa 1982, um, where people would ask about uh, questions of race or sexuality. And I didn't understand what these terms mean or meant then. I'm still not sure I understand them today. When the census people come to my apartment when I'm in New York, I'm not currently there, um, I would always insist on not listing my race when they say, what race are you? And I say, I'm, no, I'm not a race. Well, put the other. And I always insist that other is another race. But I've never conceived of myself as racialized not having grown up in racialized Europe or its white settler colonies, um, I was not racialized in the same way. So for me, these, uh, once I name myself as a race, I've, I, I'm already inserted in a kind of discourse, which of course now produces me as a certain race. And I think so, this is why I also resisted, in fact, for years writing my book, Desiring Arabs, initially. My concern was that if I'm complaining about this incitement to discourse, by writing about it, I am simply contributing to the expansion of this discourse and therefore um, neutralizing the very argument I began with. But, by the, but of course, my justification was that the discourse had expanded so much by the time I wrote the book that um, my attempt to resist through silence um, uh, was not terribly effective. Yeah, no, no, we definitely need more voices, not, uh, not less, and you know, more stories, not fewer. Uh, more others. I love that. I, I, I always fill an other whenever I can in any form that I can, which also makes me feel like a Martian sometimes. But, you know, I don't mind being a Martian. I think it can be fun. But uh, thank you so much, Charu and Joseph, for being fabulous, fascinating, as always, uh, with what you had to share with us. I'm, I'm sure it was an extremely enriching conversation for everyone. And certainly speaking on my behalf, a fabulous opening to Summer of Ish. 2021. So let me end by thanking you both immensely uh, for being so fabulous. Thank you and bye bye. And Thank we'll, you. Be, and we'll be back so next Thanks, Marley. Great interaction yeah. with you. Sure. <laughs> we'll be back next Wednesday for our session on performance, which is June 30th, a week from today.